ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, step right up and witness the death-defying, fate-flirting, mind-mesmerizing, brain-blowing feats of control and coordination. Watch as she balances the job, the house, the kids, the smells, the boss, the bills, the mess, the spills. It's the ultimate test of human strength. It's the balancing act. Listen, sometimes finding balance isn't very easy. Come on, somebody. Anybody know what I'm talking about, right? Well, today, that's what we, we're, we're continuing our series called Balance. My name is Rick Thompson. I want to welcome you. I want to welcome those who are joining us online. online. And, and in this series, we've been looking at um, trying to find balance. Uh, I call it the spiritual equilibrium. Balance in all areas, in our careers, in our church, with our schools, with our families, with our friends, and of course, in our personal lives um, with our spouses and husbands and significant others. It's easy to get off balance. And when, that, and when we get off balance in certain areas of our lives, what tends to happen after that? We start to lose our peace. We start to lose our peace. And, and, and just like when we, when we get off balance physically, what's the first thing we try to do? We try to figure out what's wrong. If something's wrong in your body, you, you, you run to the doctor, you run to this person, you run to that one. Because we're designed to be in what, the, what they call homeostasis, perfect balance. But when something throws us off, it makes us lose our peace. And, 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 and when we lose our peace, a lot of times people look for that peace in all the wrong places. They'll, they'll look for it in people and pills and parties, yeah, and even, even in places. Uh, some of you know that I, I recently came back from a, a mission trip to India and in, in a place called Tirupati. Tirupati, it took me a long time to to get that word, the Tirupati, India. And in Tirupati, they have a, a shrine uh, of a, a very famous uh, idol that, well, in, in India, they worship like something like 33,000 different gods where they will build these uh, idols and then the people think these are gods and then they go and they start worshiping them. That's what happens when you don't have the gospel. Come on, somebody, that's what happens. That's why it's important to, to preach in these places. Well, in this one, they have this very famous shrine where thousands of people go to pray. They even come from all over the world to come to this place to go to, to pray and, and, and at whatever cost. Uh, that, uh, uh, Pastor Martin was telling me that in some of these areas they have, they've told the people that the water's holy and so it will purify you. And in, in the India system, you, you want to, when you die, you want to move on to a better afterlife. And that could be anything. The reason they don't kill cows and all this other stuff is because they think it could be their relative that has reincarnated and stuff, and stuff like that. And so they, there's a huge respect for life only because they think that somebody's relative might be one of those things. And, and so because they want a better afterlife, they have this pool of water. He was telling me that they go and they bathe in this water and it's supposed to purify you. And some people have got it in their minds that if they could just because whenever they get out of the water, they start messing up again if they could just die in the water. And, and I said, are you kidding me? He said, yeah, no, they will go and they will suicide in that body of water. That's how much they believe in, in their superstitions or whatever their, their things. Now, that's, that's kind of crazy, in my opinion. But we went to this place in Terrapati where, you know, miles out on the top of a mountain, and all the way down to the bottom of the mountain, you've got to go through 
Everyone's got to get out of cars. You've got to go through metal detectors. You've got to go through screens. They don't want you bringing any other religious artifacts in there, any religious books. They're literally putting your, your bags through screens because this is supposed to be some holy mountain. Well, you get to, this, to the top of this mountain, and before you get to the top where the idols are, they've, they've got vendors, and they're selling their artifacts all surrounding whatever this God is supposed to do, and they're selling other stuff as well. And so you get to the, where the, where, and there's thousands of people coming, where the shrine is supposed to be, and there's a line. There's a cage, and the people are in this cage going into, this is the front of it, we, we went to the front of it, but this line is going back for miles. And they're slowly inching their way. And I said, well, how long do they stay in this line? Anywhere from 10 to 12 hours or more. I said, how long do they get to stay uh, to see the, the idol spending time? Two seconds. Two seconds. I said, wow. They spent all day in line to spend two seconds in front of the, this idol? Yes. I said, yeah, we have something similar like in the States. We call it Disney World. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. And so they do this in, in search of balance, in search of peace, in search of nirvana, whatever their, their word is. Kind of reminded me of a story I heard about another man who, who desperately was in search of peace. And his car broke down as he was driving past a beautiful old monastery. And he said, wow, this, this, is, this must be providence. And so he walked up, he walked up to the... Uh, to the place, that, and he knocked on the front door. A monk answered, listened to the man's story, graciously invited him to spend the night, him in. The monks fed the man and led him to a tiny chamber in which to sleep. The man thanked the monks and slept serenely until he was awakened by a strange and beautiful sound. The next morning, the monks were repairing his car, and he asked about the, the sound that had awakened him. And he said, well, we're, we're sorry, the monk said. We can't tell you about the sound. You're not a monk. Well, the man was disappointed, but he was eager to be gone, and he had to go, and so he thanked the monks for their kindness, and he went on his way. During a quiet moment uh, afterwards, the man pondered the source of their alluring sounds, and, and, and so it just kind of stuck with him. Several years it stuck with him, and so later he, did, he, he happened to be driving by that same area. He stopped at the monastery on, on a whim. He, he asked for admittance. He explained to the monks that he had so enjoyed his previous day, he wondered if he might be permitted to spend another night under their peaceful roof. The monks agreed, and so the man stayed with them again. Late that night, he again heard that strangely beautiful, unearthly sound. Well, the following morning, he begged the monks to please explain it. And the monks gave him the same answers before. We're sorry, we can't tell you about the sound. You're not a monk. By now, the man's curiosity turned to obsession. I mean, he, he decided that he's going to give up everything and he's going to become a monk. And for that, and, and for that was only, the only way he could learn about the sound. And so he informed the monks of his decision. He began the long and arduous task of becoming a monk. Seven years. Someone say seven years. Seven years later, the man was finally established as a true member of the order. And when the celebration ended, he humbly went to the leader of the order and he asked to be told the source of the wonderful sound. And silently, the old monk led the new monk to a huge wooden door. He opened the door with a, a golden key. The door swung open to reveal a second door of silver, and then a third door of gold, and so on until they passed through 12 doors, each more magnificent than the last. And the new monk's face was awash with tears of joy as he finally beheld the wondrous source of the beautiful, mysterious sound he had heard so many years before. Ah, but I can't tell you what it is because you're not a monk. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> for some of you, it's going to hit you about 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> oh, I get it. I'm not a monk. Listen, the good news is, how many of you know, we don't have to travel halfway around the world to find peace or nirvana to bring us peace. Come on, somebody. Amen or to bring balance in our life. True and lasting peace is only found, really, it's not found, it's not found at a place, it's not found in, in pills, certainly not found in, 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 in 
any earthly man or idol or monastery full of monks with golden doors and magic keys. It's found in one person. It's found in Jesus Christ. <laughs> it's found in Jesus Christ. True balance comes when we, when we give Jesus, and that's what we've been talking about over the last few weeks, when we give Jesus a focused heart, amen, a focused heart, when he becomes our true north star in life, and we stop trying to chase after other things. Number two, when we, when we get established and grounded in his grace, and the Bible says where, where, where sin abounds, grace even more abounds, amen? And so when we can start to envelop ourselves in God's grace and, the, and also allow that grace not to just flow to us, but to flow through us to other people, you, you're going you're gonna to find balance in your life. Well, I'm going to give you the third pillar to this thing called finding balance, and that is when we pursue his peace. Someone say peace. And that peace can be found in John chapter 14, verse 27. Jesus speaks of it. The world has a lot to say about it, but Jesus speaks of it. And he says, peace I leave with you. My peace, I do what? I give you. Then he says, I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. A lot of times when I read the scriptures, I like to read it in another version because it gives us a, a fuller flavor of what, what I believe Jesus was saying. And so the New Living says it this way. I'm leaving you with a gift. And what is that gift? Peace of mind and heart. Come on, somebody. Peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. And so right away, Jesus is bringing to our attention a contrast. And that contrast is between the peace that he would offer and the type of peace that the world would give everybody. Now, we talked about this peace before, the world peace. It's a pseudo peace. It's, a, it's, it, it's, a, it, it, it's an offer that comes with a temporary thing. And so... It's what they're selling when they push the new legalizations of stuff. I mean, uh, just look around. The new thing now is, you know, uh, uh, let's legalize weed. And, and somehow, somehow legalizing weed is going to help people calm down and, 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 and make it easier for them to, you know, or the e-cigarettes. The, the e anyone seen the e-cigarettes on the news lately? Come on. Anyone seen that? The, what, what, um, uh, unfortunately for many, that... You know, that little smoking little thing that they're doing has come with a price because they're getting physically ill. Even with cigarettes, it took years for it to catch up to you. With these with e-cigarettes, these e it's taking weeks and months where it's destroying lungs. Funny story about that. Church vacuum cleaner broke down, and I bought it to the Kirby vacuum store right around the corner. Anyone seen that Kirby vacuum? Anyone's been here for a few years, you, you know what I'm talking about. Some of you don't know what I'm talking about. But there was a Kirby vacuum store that's been there for years and years. And so I bought it from there. And so when it broke down, I bought it back there. And so I dropped it off for them to repair it. They called me back, says it, it's done, $15. And the one piece is still on the warranty. You, got one, you were one day after the warranty, one day before the warranty, they said. And so they're good. They honored it. This is great. And so when they called me, I sent Megan. Megan's my assistant. And Larry, Larry also is our intern. He works at the church to go pick it up. I get this phone call. PR! What are you doing? What's, what's going on? I said, what, what do you mean? The, the place where you're sending us to is a CBD store. I said, I said, I said that. I said, what, what's that? What's a CBD store? I said, they started saying, CBD, CBD. I said, what is that? What is CBD? What does that mean? I said, no, it's a, it's a, do you see a Kirby? It's a Kirby. Said, well, they have a Kirby, but well, this is the sign that she, she took a picture. It says CBD. I said, okay, well, what does that mean? She took the next, another picture. Show me the next one. Okay, and so CBD, it says, well, it says vacuum, but apparently at some point they went from vacuum cleaners to selling cannabis. <laughs> and then, then they joked, and they joked, and they said they, they, they joke. Uh, Megan jokes. He says, yeah, back in the day, probably they saw, they saw uh, and, and the vacuum cleaner store was in the back. And so back in the day, they, they sold the, the vacuums in the front and the cannabis out the back. <laughs> but since now that things have loosened up, now they're selling the, the big old sign CBD 
and now you can get, you know, any oils and it's singing on the wall. And, and the problem with it is, you know, when I sent Megan over there, she was wearing, she was wearing uh, one of our shirts. Put that picture up. <laughs> Thirsty shirt. And so I said, I said, oh, snap. She said, so what should I do? I said, you got to get a vacuum. I said, Put a jacket on, quick. Put a jacket on, run in there, get it out. She said, what if someone sees me? I said, it's all right, just go in there quick, get it out, get a jacket on. <laughs> Can you imagine? Here we go, yeah. And, I, and, and frankly, it must have been done before, because when I dropped it off, I just didn't know. I didn't know what CBD was. I didn't know what those little oils on the, <laughs> on the shelf was. I didn't know what it was. And so, hey, look, click, click, hey, look, 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 pastor of the church down the street, going into the local... Cannabis store. Listen, any peace you find in those places, listen to me, is only temporary. It's only temporary. Someone told me the other day, yeah, I got crystals and somehow these crystals are going to somehow bring you into balance and it's, it could heal you and this and that. Some of you don't know what I'm talking about, crystals. I said, all that comes out of Eastern religion, where I was just a few weeks ago, where they got 33,000 other gods. And that's just one more made up way that people, one of the things I kept telling them, listen guys, that's a rock. That's a tree. That's a monkey. That's dirt. That's a stone. Because one of the villages we went to, their god was a stone and it was right there. I said, it's right there. You drove over it? Yes. I said, and the cows walk by it and poop on it? How? They must not think too much of their God. But I kept saying, listen, we don't worship the creation over the creator. That's what the Bible says. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. So I'm not going to worship the rock that he made. I'm going to worship the one who made the rock. Amen? I'm not going to worship the tree. I said, or anything made out of these things, all right? That's the first commandment. Second commandment, thou shalt not make any graven images to bow down and to worship. It brings spiritual darkness into your life. And the devil loves it because you die, you die confused and in darkness, amen? But for anything that the world offers, listen to me, at the end of the day, it, 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 brings, it may bring a temporary peace in your life, but it's deceptively destructive at worst because it's going to lead you to bondage and disillusionment, and especially when that thing doesn't last. Those crystals, those ointments, those pills, those potions, they don't last. Let me just say also, lasting peace can't be found in a political system. Thousands of years of biblical Israeli history is proof of that when they try to make peace with their neighbors and then eventually, the neighbors would turn on them, and the peace treaties would be broken. There would be peace for a little while, but it only would last for a little while. The Bible says as it relates to the end time, as it relates to human contact and environment, there is going to be no ultimate peace until Christ returns. Amen? Amen? And so, just like anything the world gives, Jesus is saying, if you're putting all your you know, eggs in those baskets, let me get this pill, let me get this potion, let me get this person, let me go to this place. At the end of the day, you may have a pseudo peace, but it ain't gonna last. What the world gives, the world takes away. Real and lasting peace is only found in one place. It's in pursuing Jesus Christ, amen? And pursuing it his way. And so that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. That's going to be another pillar in finding the balance that we so desperately need. Again, I'm not preaching to you what the world says you have to do to find peace. I'm going to tell you what the Bible says that we have to do to find lasting peace. Amen? Number one, I want you to write this down, is you've got to put your trust in God. We pursue peace by putting our trust in God in every and all circumstances. Romans 5, uh, 1 and 2 says, Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have, help me out somebody, we have peace with God. Because, why? Because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. We have peace because of what Jesus 
has done. We talked about that last week. The wrath of God that was stored up for all for the sin on this world, Jesus took it on himself. And when he paid the price, it brought us peace with our Father. Now, as a result, verse 2, because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of, help me, help me out somebody, of what? Undeserved, what's the word used? Privilege. You are privileged and you didn't deserve it. You, you got it because now you're part of his family, amen? Where we now stand, that's what the Bible says, undeserved privilege where we now stand and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. Now listen, because we have peace with God, he gives us that promise. That promise is, the, my, now that I've accepted Jesus Christ, I've got peace with God, and now I stand, my standing has changed, and my standing is now in, in a position of undeserved privilege. Now what does that mean? This is your next fill-in. That even, even when things look bad, God's working things out, amen? Even when things look bad. Now watch this in Philippians 4, 6, and 7. We have the promise of his peace. It says, do not be anxious about, help me, anything. And do you think anything means anything? Does it say, does, do not be, does, does finances included in that? Don't be anxious about your finances. Help me, help me somebody. Don't, don't be anxious about fractured relationships. Is that included in there? Don't be anxious about uh, the fiery darts that the enemy keeps sending our way. Help me out. Is that included in that anything? How about, how about your future? Don't be anxious about your future. Is that, is that part of anything? I just want to make sure you're paying attention. And so the Bible says, do not be anxious about anything. And we know that, it, it, that anything includes anything and, and everything, right? But it says, and it says that, but in, help me, help me, every situation. Anybody got any situations going on? <laughs> anything that's kind of rocking your world or keeping you up at night? This verse is talking to you. In every situation, help me, by prayer and petition with, with thanksgiving, check your heart, present your request to God. Now, once you do that, something will result. What does it say will result? And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And so first he talks about Peace with God that happens through our relationship with Christ. He took what we deserve, and then he put us in a position of, of, of undeserved privilege. And now that I'm in a place of undeserved privilege, he says, now I can take anything or everything that's coming in my life, and I can make my petition to God, make it to him, and, and that he hears us. And now as a result, once I turn that over to him, he says, I'll give you an exchange, and the exchange is now the peace of God mm -hmm. that passes all understanding. Are you guys still with me? Because you can't put a price tag on peace. Amen. Sometimes money can't money can't buy peace. There are people with lots of money and no peace. There's no peace in their lives. There's no peace in their, their in their hearts. I'm telling you. I'm telling you how to find the spiritual balance that God offers to all of His children. And it's not because you're good, it's because God is good. There's a reason why he says it's undeserved. You didn't deserve it. I didn't deserve it. But he gave it to me anyway through his son, Jesus Christ, when I placed my faith in him. I got peace with God, and now I qualify for the peace of God. Now, having said that, you've got to go to the next step. Write this down. You've got to accept the things <laughs> you cannot change. Where have we heard that before? It's AA, right? Some of those things, right? Now I'm telling you where they got it from. All right? I'm going to show you. Accept the things you cannot change. Uh, Philippians 4.11. It says, I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned, help me, to do what? To be content. The Apostle Paul speaking. And then he tells us where he's learned to be content. What does it say? Is whatever the circumstance the same as every situation? Just humor me. It's the same thing, right? 
So Paul has learned how to be content in every situation. Is he telling the truth? Now, if it was Jesus saying it, we would say, well, that's Jesus. That's hard to attain. Okay, just so you know, Paul was a man just like you and I. Paul had flaws. Paul considered himself the worst of sinners. Paul stood around and watched the church get persecuted, even to the point of murdering the church. Paul, did some, Paul was a religious terrorist. But at some point when he got right with God and he experienced the peace with God, then he started to experience the peace of God. And then he says he's learned because of the peace of God, peace with God and peace of God, he's learned to be content in every or whatever the circumstance. Let's read on. He says, I know what it is to be in need. He's given us a circumstance. And I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Anybody willing to do that? Listen, you don't have to go to the cannabis store to figure this out or to the liquor store or travel halfway across the world to, 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 to go to a Disney World type situation where they're just raking in the money over the ignorance of people who are spending all day for two seconds in front of an idol. The Bible tells us where to find the peace. Are you ready? Here it is. He says, I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Drum roll, please. Verse 13, read it out loud with me. One, two, three. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. <sighs> Boom. Boom. There it is. There it is, the secret to finding peace in every area of your life. Paul says, I figured it out. <laughs> I can do all things through him. Who's him? Who's him? I can, do, I can do all things through Jesus who gives me strength. That's our focus, guys. That's our spiritual north star. That's the one who comes full of grace and truth. Now, I said that. Why is this important? Because some of you, under the sound of my voice right now, you're in a season of change. And you're having to deal with what I call new normals. I got called to the hospital this week, a precious young lady. Her name is Christian. Shout out to her. She may be watching because I got a chance to pray with her, minister to her, and let her know that we're, we're going to be televised. Yeah, young girl, and literally she woke up overnight paralyzed from neck down. She's since gotten her this part but the waist down, she's still paralyzed. A situation changed just like that. And she's not the only one, because I'm the pastor. <laughs> when you're the pastor, everybody calls you. I know that there are people going through situations right now where they're having to deal with what I call new normals in their lives. New situations that have popped up, whether it's career or a, a change of, of something with your children, your family situation, a friendship that's gone awkward on you or shifted. Maybe it's something medical like Christian, what, but whatever it is, you, are, you have a hard time adjusting to your situation. Listen, this is what I'm going to tell you to do. You need to start acknowledging out loud rather than rehearsing the problem, you need to start acknowledging out loud that I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Oh, say this for me again. We can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. We can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. Amen? That's what you ought to be doing. And then you start praying for a spirit of contentment. Because here's the problem. When things don't go exactly the way we think they should or we get hit with these quote-unquote new normals in our lives that kind of rock our worlds, there's a spirit of discontent that comes into, into our situation. And he starts to whisper in our ears. And, and, and when we start to, 
tune in on that. It, once we buy into it, you know, if he'd only listen, this and that, blah, 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 whatever it is, you start to listen to that spirit of discontent. And when you start to listen to it, what happens? You start to lose your peace. It robs you of your peace. And so you got to get to your place like Paul, like the Apostle Paul, where you start to accept the things you cannot change and be at peace until God makes, decides to make a decision. Amen? Lord, give me a spirit that says, come hell or high water, I can do all things through Christ who gives me. It's not going to take me out. Amen? It's not, gonna, it's not going to rob me of my peace or my joy or the purpose or the plan that God has for me because God knew about this and he made this promise, I will never leave you nor will I forsake you. Amen? But having said that, you got to accept the things you cannot change and be at peace, but you got to do the next thing. you got to change the things you can. <laughs> it's getting quiet in here. you got to change the things you can. Now, I can hear the, the people thinking right now. I can hear your thought pattern. So, Pastor Rick, right, like you just said, I, I just got to accept the things I can't change. And I said, no, I'm telling you, you got to change the things you can like, well, like what? Like what? I'm so glad you asked. Because I come up with a couple of four things that you can change when these things come into your life, these peace-robbing things that come into your life. You can change your attitude. <laughs> oh. Now, I'm not going to say it's hard or easy because you, might, you will need God's help. The psalmist said in Psalms 51.10, this is his prayer to God. He says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me, or renew a right spirit within me. Amen? The, the, give me the, every day you have a choice. You can keep rehearsing the negative stuff that's happening in your life, or you can say, you know what, God, Lord, help me to change my attitude toward this thing and stop constantly saying the, seeing the glass half empty and start focusing on what God is doing positively in my life. Amen? Proverbs 29, it says, Fools give full vent to their rage, but the wise, help, help me, bring calm in the end. In other words, <laughs> there are some people who feel like Whatever's going on in their life, it's making them mad, and they have a justification to pour out all that nonsense in other people. The Bible says of that person, you're a fool. I was just giving them a piece of my mind. Listen, you may need that piece one day. Hold on to every piece of your mind you got. Okay? This is what the Scripture says. It says, fools give full vent to the rage. But the wise, the wise bring calm in the end. Turn to someone and say, don't be a fool. You can change. <laughs> you can change your attitude. Amen? And you should. Let me, sit, let me tell you what else you can change. You can change your attention or your focus. Philippians 4.8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, what does it tell us to do? Think about those things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, he says, put into practice. And the God of what? And the God of what? So if, you take, if he says, if I change my focus or if I change my, the, the things that I'm focused on, my attention, he says the end result of, he says, instead of focusing on everything being so bad and so this and so that, Lord, where's the positive in this? He says the end result is whatever is good, whatever is pure, whatever is noble, whatever is good report. Think about those things. He says the end result will be, he says, and, and then you start to put them into practice, what you're seeing. He says the God of peace will be with you. I love that about Kristen in the hospital because she had all these things going wrong but she's a super positive person. Anyone know who I'm talking about? I mean, 
you, you, you've got all these things going wrong in your life, but you're not choosing to focus on those things. You're, use, you're choosing to focus on the possibilities of what God might do to, to turn things around. I love that. So God calls us to change the things that we are focusing on, change our attention as well. Let me give you number three. This is a big one. You need to change possibly your associations. Your associations. Now read this with me. Out loud, one, two, three. First Corinthians 15, 33, go. Do not be misled. Where are my young people? Keep it up there. Keep it up there one more time. We're going to say, we're going to say this again. One, two, three. Read it out loud. Does anybody know what that means? Yeah. Proverbs 22 through 24, 20 through 24 through 25. Listen to what it says. It says, do not make friends with a hot-tempered person. Do not associate with one easily angered, or you may learn their ways and get yourself ensnared. The people you hang out with, listen to me, influence you. Somebody said it this way, you tell me who your five closest friends are, I'll tell you who you are. If your five closest friends are partiers, chances are you'll probably be a partier too. Drinkers, chances are, those are your closest influences, that's who you are too. If your friends are hotheads and you're constantly run, seeing them running off at the mouth, doing stupid things, you're probably going to be doing, uh, that's going to rub off on you as well. And you're going to become ensnared with it. And so at some point, you've got to make a decision. If you, become a, if you want to follow, if you're going to be a follower of Christ and you want peace in your life. There, there are some people that when they drive down the road, they, can't, they cannot avoid a, a situation. You know how easy it is to avoid road rage? Just don't respond. But now you got to do this one-up thing. You know, they, they want on my bumper. I'm going to hip check and I'm going to do this. And now that you're chasing each other down the road, I've seen them. And they fly by me and I'm like, arrive alive, arrive alive. Huh? Don't kill anybody in the process, dummy. This is what I'm thinking. Yeah, because they're fools. All right? And then at some point, some, you know, their anger and their behavior gets them in trouble. And now they're dealing with the law and all this other stuff. If you've got people like that in your life, the Bible says you might have to change associations if you want peace because they're drama magnets. Don't raise your hand. And, and I'm, seeing, I'm seeing this go on here. I know that it's dark. Don't, don't point anybody out. It's getting quiet in here. If you're a drama magnet, please stand up. Don't stand up. I'm just drama magnets. All right? So... For some, of you, for some of you, it's the people you're hanging around. For some, for some of you, it's you. And you need to repent of it because you're not going to have peace in your life as long as you're constantly running into these crazy situations because you think that somehow your anger justifies your behavior. It doesn't. The Bible talks about leaving room for the wrath of God. You know why you leave room for the wrath of God? Because he's the only one that gets it right every time. All of us, all we're seeing is what they did to me just now. God knows what happened to the person when they were three. And so when he brings out a judgment, who's going to say, God, you were wrong? You can say it, but it won't matter because he's always right. But when we jump into these little road rage, I'm going to give you everything that I got. The Bible says you're a fool, number one. And number two, you're a bad witness. And so if you want peace in your life, start disassociating. And if you're that person, you need to repent of it and ask God to get that area of your life under control. Let me give you the fourth and final. You can change your Approach. Change your approach. Proverbs 14, 12 says, there is a path before each person that seems right, 
But what, what's the end result? It ends in death. And so in front of everybody, they think what they're doing is the right way. And when you're a world unto your own, when you're, when you're the be-all and end-all in terms of advice and your own wisdom and you're just smarter than everybody, you are in danger of falling into this trap. There's a, there, I'm going to read it again. There's a path before each person that seems right, but the end leads to death. Now, it tells us how to avoid this path. Proverbs 12, 15, it says, The way of fools, <laughs> cause that person a fool, seems right to them, but the wise do what? The wise do what? The wise do what? So the fool does, does what they want because whatever path is in front of them seems right. But the wise person actually listens to advice. So that person in your life who's been saying wise counsel to you, and I don't say that everybody gives wise counsel, but there are people who you know in your heart, they're giving you wise counsel. You just, in your heart, you've got foolishness in there and you just want to do whatever you want to do. The fool does whatever he wants. The wise person will listen. There are people who come to me and they have marital problems or the wife will come or the husband will come and I'll call them up and say, hey, let's get, let's get together or go to a council. I'm, I don't need nobody. I mean, men are, bad. men are pretty bad with that. They don't want to stop for directions. They don't want to stop. They'll just drive around crazy until they find something. They don't. And the young men today is going to be worse because my generation, at least in, with directions, we knew what north and south was. In this generation, the, the GPS, if the GPS goes down, they're in trouble. They're lost in their own front yard. <laughs> and so if they don't want to ask for direction, they're just like, what's he doing? Running around the neighborhood, looking like that. I mean, I, I, I'm joking. But, but not really. <laughs> but we're bad because we don't like direction. So I, I call him up and say, hey, you know, things are kind of rough at the home because you know, as the pastor, I'm, I'm, when, I'm, you're the, when, I'm, when you're the pastor, you're the pastor of everybody. It's not, I'm not just the pastor of the men. I'm the pastor of, of the women that come to church. I'm the pastor of the, the youth that come. And, and so they'll share their heart. And so I say, bro, you know, things, are, things sound like they're getting, I don't need any of that. And the next thing you know, you know, their situation goes because they cannot listen to advice. They can't humble their heart to what's, should be obvious in front of them. A fool does that. A fool will not listen, but a wise person will take advice. So I want you to think about right now that person or persons who have been telling you things, and now you've, re you've reacted like you know, you've slammed doors, you've cut them out of your life, you this and that, and, and you think that it's, it's over, it's not over. Because you're, you're on the path of a fool. And the Bible says, <laughs> everyone thinks they're right in their own eyes, but it's going to lead to a different path. The way to figure out how to get off that foolish path is to get some wise counsel in your life. Everybody needs wise counsel from time to time. Amen? Getting quiet in here. And then let me just say this in Romans 12, 18. It says, do your best to live in peace with everyone. Let that permeate for a minute because peace should be your guiding principle. The Bible says that we, as a Christian, as a Christ follower, if we want to find balance in our lives, that we should do our best. One translation says, do your part. Pastor Rick, I went to them and, you know, they shut me down and this and that. I said, okay, then you've done your part. All you can do is your part. And so the Bible says, do your part to pursue peace with everyone. Have you done your part? 
Well, I'm waiting on them. I put them in a bubble. They're going to go over there now. No, you're not doing your part. Actually, the Bible gives instructions on if somebody offends you what to do. You know what it says? Go to them. Not 15 people around them. Not their mother and their brother, their sisters. And, you know, go to them. And it says, if that doesn't work, bring a second person. And, 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 and the whole purpose of it is to bring peace into your situation. We should be peacemakers. That should be the mark of a follower of Christ, not drama-filled fools. Let me give the last. What, 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 what's, what's the P for pursuing? Put your trust in God. What's E? Even when things look bad. What's A? Accept, what, accept the things you cannot change. Be content. And what's C? Change the things you can. Let me give you the E, the, the, the final one. Expect God to move. Expect God to to move. Now, I love this. I love this because unlike these dead idols where the people have taken a piece of tree, like the Bible says, and cut it down and half the tree, they form this idol and they put it and they have to physically take it to a stand and put it on the stand. The idol can't even, the God that now they're bound to can't even physically move itself. They, they have to move it. They, they put it on a stand, then they bow down two, three times a day and worship the thing that they made. And the Bible says with the other half of that tree, they take it and they use it for wood <laughs> and to cook with. It makes no sense. They burn it, all right? Unlike people who are under that system, how many know we serve a risen Savior? You know how I know? I said before, I talked with him this morning. He's alive and he's a well. And he's listening and he's pursuing us. And we have a relationship with him through the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, and if you're not going to the men's Bible study or the ladies' Bible study, you are missing out. But that's what we're talking about. The Holy Spirit is a person that you need to establish a relationship with. The same way that you had to establish a relationship with your husband or your wife, that at some time, if you guys were going to bond, you were going to spend some time talking to them and, and, and figuring them out. That a lot of times we get saved, and then we think of the Holy Spirit as this, you know, cloud floating around, and we don't have a relationship. The Holy Spirit is how God communicates with us. It's what, he, it's what Jesus is taking up residence in our heart. It's through the Holy Spirit. And so, he's there, and we have an opportunity to talk with him and walk with him every single day. Amen? And, that, and if we're listening, you might just hear him talk back because he's alive. So Jesus tells us this story surrounding the expecting God to move in our lives. He tells these stories in Luke chapter 18, these stories with a point. They call them parables. And he says, one day Jesus told his disciples a story to show them that they should always pray and never give up. And so he says, there was a, a judge in a certain city, and he said, who neither feared God nor cared about people, a widow, and a widow of that same city came to him repeatedly saying, give me justice in this dispute with my enemy. And the judge ignored her for a while. But finally he said to himself, I don't fear God or care about people, but this woman is driving me crazy. I'm going to see that she gets justice because she's wearing me out with her constant requests. Verse 6, then the Lord said, learn a lesson from this unjust judge. Even he rendered a just decision in the end. So don't you think God will surely give justice to those, to, to, to his chosen people who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will grant justice to them quickly. Someone say quickly. 
But when the Son of Man returns, <laughs> how many will how how many will he find on the earth who have faith? We're gonna talk about this next week, but that, that's part of it. You need faith to know that you have a God that is listening. And so Jesus says, he tells a story about this unjust judge and this woman, and the judge doesn't fear God or fear people, but because this woman's gonna keep coming to him every day, he said, I'm gonna give her what she needs because she's she gonna wear me out. And, and the message is simply this, God is inviting us all. If, if that judge will do the right thing based on that, he says, how much more will God do if we bring our petitions to him? Because he's a good God, amen? But he invites us to, to bring them to him and to, and to expect those things. He, 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 the, 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 the folks, the, the table is set and the invitation is going out. And, and the Bible says to come boldly into his throne room of grace. And there we're going to find mercy and grace in times of, and, 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 and grace to help us in our times of need. But we'll also find that the moment we accept Jesus Christ, that we will have, have established peace with God because all of our sins are washed away. They were, the, the penalty for our sins was laid on him. And now I'm in right standing. And now I have undeserved privilege. And because I have undeserved privilege with him, not only do I have peace with God. Now he says, now I can have the peace of God. And it tells me don't worry about anything, but to pray about everything. Let my petition be known to God with thanksgiving. And then he says, the end result will be this. And can I get the prayer team to come on up here? He says, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Stop running away from God. Apply just a little faith to your situation, your circumstance, and bring that petition to the God, the, the one who loves you the most. He says, he says, cast your cares on me because I care for you. Now, in a moment, I'm going to open up this altar. I'm going to ask everyone, don't leave yet. Give me just a few minutes. But let's establish the peace with God. For I know most of you know but there might be one or two of you who just don't know how you get in right relationship with God. How do you get the peace with God that was purchased through his son, Jesus Christ? That whole scenario about Jesus dying on the cross isn't just a pretty story. It, it, the Bible literally calls him the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. The Bible says that the wrath of God abides on this world because of its sin, but God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So the moment that I recognize and, and my spirit comes in agreement with what the word of God says, the truth, says you will know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Here's the truth. All have sinned. Every single one of us. There's none righteous, no, not one. And the wages of sin is death. The death it's talking about is not a physical death. It's eternal separation from the Father. It's the second death the Bible talks about. If everybody dies the first death physically. Unless Christ returns, everyone's going to die physically. But not everyone has to die that second death, which is what it says, that we all have been given a, a, a spirit that will live forever somewhere. The moment God took Adam and breathed into him, you were given a, a life-giving spirit, and we're all related to Adam. And that life-giving spirit, although we are encased in a physical body, this physical body will one day fall back to the earth from which it came, but that spirit is going to live forever somewhere. And the invitation goes out. Because of the sin of Adam, sin has passed down to all mankind, and the wages of sin is death. But because of the goodness of God has foreseen through Jesus Christ, it says the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus, who took our sins on the cross and paid them. And when the moment I place my trust in him, there's an exchange that takes place. My filthy rags, my sins will place on Jesus. And in exchange, Jesus, who did no wrong, I get now his robes of righteousness. And now when God looks at me, he doesn't see Rick Thompson, the sinner, he sees the righteous robes of Jesus that he put on me, establishing peace with God. <sighs> Come on, somebody. 
Come on. And now I've been adopted into his family. And I've got a position of undeserved privilege. So that when things happen, and things happen in this world, because we live in a fallen world, and those suddenlies come our way, and those situations that all of a sudden you've got to deal with a new normal, he's telling me, you don't have to do that by yourself. He says, don't, those things that cause us to worry, he says, let the, the world can do that if they want to. The, the Christian believer, I'm giving you a, a different way. I don't want, those things will throw you off. I don't want you having to move to another country and chase down idols and go to CBD, whatever, whatever, FYZ, XYZ shops, whatever they are, chasing pills and potions and, and crystals and all this other stuff. If you want peace that lasts, he says, the world, he's, the world's going to give you peace. The world's going to take it away. It's temporary. You're going to get a temporary high. You're going to come back down. And then you know, all your problems are still going to be there. He said, the peace I give you will not be taken from you. So you get peace with God. And then now I can have the peace of God. And so that first invitation is going to go out to you. If you've not established forgiveness, if you've not asked God to forgive you of your sins and put your trust in Christ so that you can have the peace with God, that's going to be my first invitation. It would be my privilege and my honor to lead you in a prayer. It's not, not all that difficult. You have to humble your heart and say, I cannot save myself. Some of you are thinking, even on the side of my voice, well, Pastor Rick, I'm not a good, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a good guy. No, 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 you're not. You're not as good as you think you are. Because the Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned. You're not the exception, and neither am I. And, and the wages of sin is death. And if it ended there, that wouldn't be good news. But it goes on to say, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You have to accept Christ in your life. Someone asking him to bow their heads and close their eyes. And if that's you today, if you've not yet accepted him and you would like to, would you like me to lead you in a prayer of acceptance? Raise your hand. Say, I, I would like that, Pastor Rick. I, just, I, I, I need Jesus in my life. Is there anybody? I see your hand. Anybody else? I want Jesus. Well, say this. Say this from your heart. Say, Heavenly Father, I come before you. I acknowledge that I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. Say it out loud. I ask you to forgive me of my sins, to come into my life and come into my heart. From this day forward, I submit my life to you. Thank you for dying on the cross 2,000 years ago, not for your sins, but for mine. Three days later, rising from the dead. And because you live, and because I place my faith in you, I will live as well. In Jesus' name. And for those who are already Christians, or maybe you just said that prayer, what's rocking your world right now? Listen, the Bible says not only do we get the peace with God, but we can have the peace of God. So for the next few moments, if you've got things going on in your life that you need to bring to the altar and you want someone to come in agreement with you, the huh? Bible says two or more agree upon touching any one thing, it shall be done. For the next few moments, this altar will be open. Come forward. If you pray to receive Christ for the first time, you come forward as well. We want to pray a blessing over you.